We are the restaurant brokers and we sell restaurants. We started the nation's largest restaurant brokerage firm over a decade ago. Atlanta, Georgia was our starting point, but our brand is spreading nationwide. We define restaurant brokerage and help buyers just like these. Our dream, our goal, open up a restaurant, love and life, <laughs> serving people breakfast and lunch, and then enjoying the rest of the day with them and ourselves. Buying an existing restaurant, leasing a closed restaurant space, or purchasing a restaurant franchise. We help buyers satisfy their appetite for acquisition. I'm part of a husband and wife team with this fella. Working with my wife has been a lot of fun. The ultimate goal for everybody here is to make this work. And because we have different strengths, we bring different angles to the deal. The process begins with our powerhouse website, WeSellRestaurants.com, where buyers sign online confidentiality agreements and browse restaurants for sale. Then we send buyers undercover to check out a restaurant and decide if it's the right one for them. Buyers get our proprietary business analysis tool with all the financial details on the business for sale. After studying the restaurant inside and out, it's back to our office. We are deal makers. We write contracts and negotiate terms for buyers and sellers. That's why we sell more restaurants than any other firm in the nation. We are the restaurant brokers. Our name says it all. I'm Robin Gagnon. And I'm Eric Gagnon, and we sell restaurants. We started the nation's largest restaurant brokerage firm, We Sell Restaurants, over a decade ago. You can find us online at WeSellRestaurants.com. And that's not all. We're also on your radio once a week with the leading authorities in the restaurant industry talking about subjects trending in the restaurant business. You can tweet your questions on the topic while we are on the air to our Twitter handle. You know it. It's at Sell Restaurants. Post to our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash We Sell Restaurants. If we don't get to your questions, we will follow up on social media. Our goal is to satisfy your appetite for acquisition, feed the need for restaurant reality, and serve up a recipe for business success. If you have any ideas or any comments about the show, feel free to send me an email. My email is eric, E-R-I-C, at WeSellRestaurants.com. Today is a very special show. We are talking with some leaders in the industry, writers, editors, those are on the cutting edge of what's happening in food magazines, and they are dishing up the scoop on the business. So our first guest today is Sharon Palmer. Sharon has created an award-winning profession based on combining her two great loves, food and writing. She's a registered dietitian with 16 years of healthcare experience and channels that into writing features covering health, wellness, nutrition, and cuisine. She is also a passionate writer about food and environmental issues, having published a number of features on plant-based diets, hunger, local and organic foods, culinary practices, and much more. Over 850 of Sharon's features have been published in a variety of publications, including Better Home and Gardens, Prevention, Oxygen, LA Times, Cooking Smart, and Culinology. She is an author, and books include The Plant-Powered Life, Beginning Today, and Plant-Powered by Life for... Plant Powered for Life, excuse me, Eat Your Way to Lasting Health with 52 Simple Steps and 125 Delicious Recipes. She is the editor of the health newsletter Environmental Nutrition and nutrition editor for Today's Dietitian. She writes every day for her blog and she will serve as a returning judge for the 2015 James Beard Journalism Awards. She was the proud recipient of the Loma Linda University Distinguished Alumni Award. She lives in uh, the hills overlooking Los Angeles with her husband and two sons. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We are also joined today by Nina Elder. Nina has been with Every Day with Rachel Ray since 2011 and became deputy food editor in 2013. Before joining the magazine, she was a member of the editorial teams of Bon Appetit and Better Homes and Gardens. Her work has been nominated for a Bird Green Award by the International Association of Culinary Professionals, as well as for James Beard Foundation Journalism Award. After graduating from GHS and the University of Missouri, Nina moved to Des Moines, Iowa for an internship at Midwest Livings. Next, she moved on to become a tra- the Travel and Features Editor for Better Homes and Gardens magazine. Her job at Better Home and provided a broad background in writing and editing stories, not only about travel, but also about health issues. She wrote the Motley Health Update column, Children's Ideas, and also gave her an, an entry into writing about food and cooking. 
As an executive food editor at Ray's Magazine, Nina works with writers, photographers, designers, recipe developers, and test kitchen staff to create seasonal feature and appealing articles about food and cooking with an emphasis on fast, easy recipe and creative ideas. We are so glad you're with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. And for our final guest, we are joined by Janet. Excuse me, we're joined by Janet Helm, a registered dietitian, nutrition blogger, chief food and nutrition strategist in North America at Weber Shandwick, a global public relations firm and a cookbook author. Janet is the author of the blog Nutrition Unplugged, where she frequently addresses food nutrition trends and the latest diet crazes. She's also the the co-founder of the Nutrition Blog Network and Healthy Aperture, the first online food photo gallery focused on healthy food. She recently published her first, first book with the editors of Cooking Light called The Food Lover's Healthy Habits Cookbook. She also blogs for U.S. News and World Report. Janet, welcome to the show. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. So we are just so excited to have all you guys on board. And the first thing we want to do, you are on the cutting edge because you are obviously writing and blogging and talking with folks in the industry every single day and fielding articles. Tell us about the hot nutrition trends for 2015. Janet, you want to start us off? Oh, absolutely. Well, I would say, you know, starting off, I would say it's the rise of more plant-based meals. Um, whether that's meat alternatives, um, and beans and legumes seem to be kind of the, the new darling of the proteins, uh, non-meat proteins. But it's also just vegetables have become more center of the plate. You know, the, they, you know, used to be on the side, now they have, have risen to center of the plate star. So I think the plant-based meals we're going to see a lot more, and it's not just about the, the vegetarian meal, but I think that, that chefs are embracing um, cooking with, you know, maybe it's just making meat as, as more of a condiment. But I think there there's a lot of interest in, in not only for our health, but environment, and that's how people are, are looking at food today. They're, they're combining both personal health and planetary health. That's great. Nita, what do you see coming up for 2015? Um, as far as health concerned, I mean, we, we cover that a little bit in the magazine. We have a, a very broad audience here. Um, one thing to just uh, to bounce off of what Janet said in our in our Jan Feb issue, in fact, we have a story that's all about eating in a flexitarian way. So we have these recipes that are plant based and vegetarian, but then we have the option of adding meat, which we find is very helpful for our you know readers, which are you know moms who are like cooking a Tuesday night dinner. And so then, if you have different kind of eaters at the table, you know you could make this creamy mushroom pasta, for instance, for them, for the, the vegetarians, and then add a little ham steak for, for the meat eaters. So we're, we're finding things like that are, are appealing to our readers, too, which are the majority are, are home cooks. And I would also second that kind of veg, vegeta, vegetables, excuse me, moving to the center of the plate. I'm finding that a lot when I eat out at restaurants where, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll I'll have a dinner in, in most recent memory a few weeks ago at Upland here in New York City, and one of the most memorable dishes there was a beet dish, and there were there was no meat in there, but we were all ooing and aahing about this <clears throat> beet dish, as well as this kind of Caesar salad that was you know had used so many different lettuces and had these delicious croutons. There was a tiny bit of anchovy, but it was mainly mainly vegetables, and all of us at the table were talking about those days later. I love that catchphrase, flexitarian. I can hear that uh, really resonating with uh, our audience and those foodies who are out there because I think that everyone is kind of moving towards that push for better health. Sharon, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yes, I agree. You know, there are some recent surveys that indicated 50% of people are trying to cut back on meat, and it's this flexitarian movement um, even though they may not be interested in becoming a vegetarian, they, they see that there are health and environmental benefits from eating more plant foods. So I definitely think that's a trend, and the chefs are really leading the way. You know, they're, they're in love with vegetables, you know, which inspires home cooks. But, you know, this, the whole thing about going to a farmer's market and, you know, having seasonal, beautiful uh, heritage and heirloom produce is a huge trend. And I also think, you know, that that... There are other trends that are kind of feeding into, this is also a health conscious movement, environmental movement, but also this idea of clean eating, um, you know, the GMO free thing is very popular right now. So all these things kind of feed into, you know, this idea of eating more um, minimally processed plants and that's on the consumer's radar. You know, I think it's interesting while we have, you know, certainly the rise of plant-based meals, we have some dueling trends, though, at the same time, because paleo 
um, eating like a caveman is is also you know very popular and and I know that that restaurants are are trying to appeal to those who who are eating a more paleo um, lifestyle and and where meat may be more um, uh, more dominant. Um, so there's a couple of dueling trends, which I know makes it you know challenging for restaurateurs. So are we thinking here that I know paleo was a little bit quite popular in in the, in the past year. So are we seeing still some growth in that in that sector here and coming up in the coming year? Well, you know, I don't see it letting up yet. I mean, as a dietitian, I uh, it's not. I think there's some there's some nice aspects of paleo as far as you know, cooking more of your own food, uh, maybe reducing you know sugar and refined carbs. There's there's some positive things, but you know, and and paleo. Some many paleo followers would say, hey, it's not just a meat centric diet. Um, so you can eat well eating paleo, or it's it's too heavy in, in meat and saturated fat. But um, I, I'm hoping that paleo is, is um, it, it, maybe it's, it's getting a little healthier as far as, hey, you know, there are other ways that you can uh, have vegetables more dominant, um, you know, and, and not be so heavy on, on meat. But I think it's, I don't know, what, what do my uh, colleagues here think about uh, paleo, whether it's, uh, has it peaked perhaps? This is, this is, I, you know, I kind of feel like it might have peaked and and um, that it's on the decline, but that's kind of my own anecdotal sort of information. Um, you know, I do see that in in my world in California, it's very popular right now, and it, and it is very meat based, and it you know they completely avoid grains. So I feel like you know um, in a science based way, there's not a lot of evidence that the whole mm-hmm. sort of diet, and I see that it's you know, it's very difficult to sustain. People kind of go on and off it, you know. But it is kind of interesting that we have these two kind of spectrums of diet patterns, uh, the paleo and the plant-based. And another uh, perspective is that I'm starting to see a a decline in these fad-type diets. I mean, it's more lifestyle diets now. You're either in, you know, a paleo lifestyle or, you know, a plant-based lifestyle rather than these little two-week diet plans, which I think is kind of an encouraging shift. Hey, Nina, I want to get you to weigh in here because Meatless Mondays is, you know, is kind of a staple of the the uh, world out there and that uh, Rachel Ray talks about love great things, so veggie-focused trends. Um, where do you stand on the paleo versus veggie plant-based idea? Well, I'm, I'm seeing personally the kind of the paleo and, and vegetables, both the things like, like we've been talking about. Uh, but for our readers, there's not, at least what we've seen so far, there's not a, there's not a huge demand for like paleo-friendly recipes. The thing about paleo, and I, and I think we're kind of touching on this, is it does seem like a fad diet. But the thing about the paleo lifestyle, which I think was an excellent kind of way to define it, you know, because the paleo lifestyle often will go with, you know, higher protein. I also find, you know, at least in my anecdotal evidence, these are people who, you know, tend more toward, you know, CrossFit, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. There's a whole, there's a whole thing, you know, kind of a paleo mentality. And, and I think, you know, the whole vegetarian and flexitarian thing, I think this all could be under the general umbrella of kind of more mindful eating, whatever that may be, you know, whether you're more into like the, the paleo thing or the flexitarian thing or a little bit of both. You know, I think it stems from, you know, all the way back to kind of Michael Pollan, you know, thinking more about what we're eating whether that's vegetables, whether that's meat, and if you're eating meat, how it's raised. And I think our readers, you know, again, a mainstream audience, are very interested in that. The other thing I'm seeing kind of out in the world, and, and I would, I'd love to know what the other panelists think of this, is kind of the, the interest in protein, you know, whether that be a giant steak or cricket meal or, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm also finding, you know, it's, it's broader than just meat, but I feel like people have this kind of protein focus, too, that I'm, I'm noticing. Oh, absolutely on the protein, and, and because there is research on on the benefits of a protein. Certainly, uh, satiety, having more protein in the morning. Um, I, I think what the big benefit of some of this um, is going to be legumes, beans. I, I think that you know, um, you know, at the recent food nutrition conference and expo um, they attended, I, I you know, I recently wrote about the. Um, the, the trend on the exhibit floor there, and I said it was the year of the bean. I mean, there were beans were everything. It was, um, you know, in veggie burgers. It was in pasta. It was in crackers. Uh, you know, so I think the idea of a plant-based protein, specifically beans, peas, lentils, seem to be very, very popular. Mm-hmm. I agree, Janet. Um, I think 
beans are huge. It's this humble food that so many um, traditional diets are based on, and it's so wonderful to see it come back because it's a it's a very beneficial food. It has so much fiber and great protein source, um, you know, sustainable. And I love this the trend of heritage beans. So it's not just your your garbanzos and kidneys, but all of these unusual um, beans that that are getting more and more available, like uh, yellow Indian beans I have and Cherokee beans, all these unusual colors and varieties that make it more fun. I love that. And, and see, that, that's what one of my troubles with the paleo diet because you don't get to have any beans and you don't get to have any grains. And the that other sounds like no fun at all. Is, is ancient grains. So it's the heritage beans and all the great variety of beans, but it's also these wonderful whole grains that I, I think, you know, I, I base a lot of meals around whole grains because there's so much you can do with that, uh, whether it's like a big power bowl where you're adding a lot of vegetables to it or, you know, it's some kind of like a um, risotto type dish or a couscous made with some of these great grains. And there's so many, you know, it's not just about quinoa anymore. Well, that, um, that leads in a good, a good segue here for the question I was going to ask you guys. Is about yeah. We just said beans. It's 2015 and so forth. What beans? Is it going to be the year of the bean? But what else we're going to see? What's going to be the next kale or canola that we saw this past year and stuff like that? Well, I I think for the next kale, which I, I'm kind of over kale. You know, uh, I think <laughs> I'm has, with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think kale has peaked. Um, I would say beets have already emerged, and um, but I think it's cauliflower. Um, and I think cauliflower is, there's just this new love for cauliflower in all the many ways that you can prepare it um, as a steak, you know, slicing it um, in, in big steaks and roasting it. It's showing up as a rice, as a substitute for rice. Um, it's showing up as a pizza crust. I mean, there's, and it's showing up as a substitute for buffalo wings, you know, making roasted cauliflower with buffalo sauce. So I think cauliflower is is so versatile and i think it's been the kind of the in the shadow of broccoli for so long but now i think cauliflower is coming into its own and and maybe the the new kale well this is nina and um with with the cauliflower the thing that i think is interesting is it's kind of you know it's kind of like tofu in a way you know it, it's neutral enough in flavor that you can customize it however you'd like if you want to marinate it or roast it or flavor it up or what have you so and and the cauliflower crust is an excellent point which i feel like is you know at least for a while was all over pinterest that was all that uh-huh. anyone was pinning yeah i've done yeah, that I, uh, I, cauliflower pizza crust it's really good i'm sorry somebody else was going to jump um, in there go ahead i was just going to chime in and say i agree with the with the cauliflower and uh, I, it's interesting because I also think Brussels sprouts has been out there. It's nothing that new. But a lot of these foods are related to each other, and they, they, they roast really well. They get these yummy caramelized flavors when you cook them. And uh, it's interesting because these are the vegetables that people used to hate, you know, and now they're so trendy, and but they're so healthy. But I also see, I think nuts and seeds are also going to be like the new it foods, things like chia and hemp, which have already been around, but I think we're just going to even see more and more of those things as well. I'm also seeing millet randomly. Millet, Which you always associate with bird seed, but I'm like, okay, well, millet's a thing now. Yes. In fact, I just wrote a recent um, piece about, you know, foods that I'd like to, you know, see shine in 2015, and I, millet was on the list um, Mm -hmm. because I think, I mean, it has been associated with, with bird seed, I mean, not in the U.S., that's how that's primarily how it's used. But <laughs> it, it is a wonderful, um, also gluten-free, high-protein grain like quinoa. Um, and the good thing about millet is that it's being grown here. I mean, mm-hmm. quinoa uh, has typically been, um, you know, in, in Peru and Bolivia, and and now millet is being grown more um, in the U.S. And I, I think more and more people mm-hmm. are going to discover that whole grain. So I want to ask each one of you a question because you are, you know, leading in the industry, uh, kind of on the leading edge of writing about these new trends. So are, do the trends bubble up from the kitchens? Or where do they actually start? Or is or you begin to notice things and you begin to talk about them and then they bubble out? Like what makes, uh, you know, millet stop being considered birdseed and start being top of mind and what makes makes this the year of the bean? Where do these trends originate? Is are the chefs doing it? Are the home chefs uh, 
creating the the trend or are you creating just kind of this groundswell from all the writing and blogging and Nina let me ask you to go first because I think if a if a chef like Rachel Ray says wow this is the new it thing does it just take on a life of its own I mean I think in kind of our new kind of food slash foodie obsessed world I think a lot of the trends do stem from from restaurant kitchens and and chefs you know like Rachel and and, and other folks who are out there cooking. And I, I do think they do have a lot of power. You know, when they say something's a thing, then it becomes a thing. The other thing that I'm finding interesting, and, you know, I've been in this business for a little while now, is what I'm, what I'm noticing is definitely the chefs have a lot of power, but also because so many, you know, average, everyday consumers are so interested in food and passionate about it and reading blogs and magazines and watching the Food Network and everything else, I feel like, you know, a, a lot of, there's a groundswell also from, you know, again, you know, bloggers and just home cooks. And because we have platforms like Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest and things like that, you can really get your kind of personal brand and message and ideas and, you know, trends out into the world. And so I think it's, it's really made a lot more people experts, so to speak, and, and given them a platform to and, – and for the magazine, when we're looking for trends, we're looking across the board. We're looking at restaurants. We're looking, of course, to Rachel and uh, – first and foremost, but, you know, and bloggers and what we're seeing our friends cooking and posting, you know, a a lot of my friends in my Instagram feed, you know, they're cooking out of the Plenty More cookbook, which is the the newest Otto Lenghi cookbook, you know, Uh which again is kind of plant-based. And and another thing that I'm seeing is, you know, like Middle Eastern flavor. So that's the kind of thing, you know, I I feel like it's a broader base of inspiration. I love that that broader base of inspiration. I'm sorry, jump in there. Oh, I was just saying that is such a good point. Um, that how it's changed today when you look at tr- typically a life cycle of a trend where where it used to be that it, it all originated from high-end chefs and then the media start writing about it then it starts showing up in 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 supermarkets and and then it's in a fast food you know and becomes more mainstream so there there was really more of the in this trend mapping um it was a longer time period before something became a mainstream trend but i would say now um you know, absolutely agree that, you know, with Pinterest, I mean, there, there are foods that are emerging just because it's showing up on Pinterest and, it, and it's suddenly, you know, um, a hot trend because everyone's taking pictures of it and posting it on, uh, on Pinterest or, or Instagram. So I think, you know, we've kind of broken that, that longer term of, of a trend mapping cycle because of the consumer groundswell of um, a trend can start anywhere. I love that. So, mm-hmm. what do you, what are your thoughts, Janet? <clears throat> oh, excuse me, Sharon. Yes, uh, I agree with that. It's interesting how things have changed. But I also I also think it's interesting when when the stars align for a particular food like kale or ancient grains, because it's like the chefs are are introducing it. It's more available in social media, but then it's also healthy. So these foods that have all these things going for them, they just become superfoods. And I'm thinking of you know, kale is an example, or even ancient grains, you know, when you have our, our government uh, dietary guidelines, we're talking about eating more whole grains, so, but yet they're, you know, the chefs are enjoying them because they're something interesting and delicious and flavorful with textures, so it just kind of all uh, aligns together. That, that's very interesting, and you know, you, maybe even uh, food costs, you know, as proteins and meats, a lot have gone so up in price, maybe uh the beans and some other things that we talked about are a little more cost efficient. I think also influence a lot of the the uh, chefs and the bloggers and everything to try different things to keep a little bit uh, cost more in line. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think yeah, that, absolutely. I think people always, you know, we have a column in our magazine every month called Dinners for a Deal. That's one of our most popular columns, and you know, I think people always are looking for a value when they're when they're making dinner. And you know, if it's if it's a value and it's delicious and it happens to be a hot trend, then you know, you're you're three for three. Uh, That's a home run for sure. Well, stay tuned. We're going to be back in a minute. This is Eric and Robin Gagnon, the restaurant brokers, and we are on the air with the experts this week, influential writers, editors, two experts in the food magazine space as we satisfy your appetite for acquisition, feed the need for restaurant reality, and serve up a recipe for business success. We'll be right back with more information after this very brief timeout. 